Well, good morning, MCC family. Hey, if we've not met before, my name is Eric. I'm the student pastor here at MCC, and I'm excited to continue in our First Timothy series with you this morning. Hey, if you missed last week, I want to encourage you to go back and watch the message. We had Earl Hobner here. He's one of the missionaries that we support, Central Brazil Mission. It was a very impactful, very important message. So I want to urge you that if you missed it last week to go ahead, go back to our YouTube page or our Facebook page, rewatch that message. It was really good. But today, you and I, we're going to be more planted in the book of First Timothy. And really, we're going to be in First Timothy chapter 2. But before we can talk about First Timothy chapter 2, we have to take a step back and do something we didn't get a chance to do last week, which is talk about the broader context of First Timothy and what is happening here, and look a little more closely at First Timothy chapter 1. You see, First Timothy is written by Paul to one of his disciples, Timothy, and it's a letter helping Timothy address issues to the church in Ephesus, right? It's a letter helping Timothy address issues in the church in Ephesus, because the church in Ephesus is in trouble. I want you to hear that. At this point in Ephesus' story, it's a church in trouble trouble. They're a church facing a large amount of issues. There's false teaching happening. There's arguments happening. There's people usurping leadership position. And this letter is written in light of that challenge. It's a letter written by Paul to Timothy to encourage and help Timothy address those issues. It's a letter written by Paul to Timothy to encourage and help Timothy address those issues. So read with me as we start in 1 Timothy chapter 1, where it says this, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrine any longer or to devote themselves to myths or endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculation rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about and what they so confidently affirm. So we're going to pause here real quick and we're going to understand. Paul is saying that there are teachers who have devoted themselves to false doctrines, endless genealogies. This is causing issues within the early church. It's tossing people every which way. And Paul reminds us of something very important in this passage. Paul goes on to remind us that the law is good if one uses it properly. The law, which is the Torah, that's what Paul would have been referring to here, okay? The Hebrew scriptures are good if used properly and taught correctly. The law of God will free us and transform us. Hear that this morning. The law of God will free us and transform us. Continue reading with me in verse 8, where it says, we know the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law was not made for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly, the sinful, the unholy, the irreligious, those who kill their fathers or mothers or murderers, for the sexual immoral, for those who practice homosexuality, for slave traders and liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. Teaching that is faithful to Jesus results in love and genuine faith. Correct teaching of the law reveals the grace of God and his great love for us. Hear that this morning. Correct teaching about the law reveals God's grace and his great love for us. It shows us in these verses 8 through 11 that none are righteous except the Messiah who came to save the world. None are righteous except the Messiah who came to save the world. Paul boils all that down in verse 15 where he says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of who I am the worst. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Paul says that about himself, but He also writes in a lot of his other books about how we all fall short of the glory of God, how all are in need of a Savior. So when Paul says, here's a trustworthy saying, deserving of full acceptance, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst, I don't want you to think that Paul is the worst. I want you to actually put yourself in that moment. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom you are the worst, of whom I 
am the worst. Sit with that for a second. All are unrighteous and in need of a Savior. That is what the law reveals to us. All in this room have fallen short of God's glory. Unless your name is Jesus Christ, then hello, nice to meet you. I'd love to talk to you after service. This whole passage is Paul trying to help Timothy get a foundation of how he can begin to address issues within the church. Issues that I bet are prevalent even in our society today because there are plenty of arguments in our day. There are plenty of reasons to squabble and get angry. There are plenty of false teachers, but our job as followers of Jesus is to rightly divide the word of truth and share it with a broken world because the broken world is in desperate need of a Savior and good news He came for me, and he came for you. The law is good because it reveals our need for a Savior. It is not meant to hinder us from experiencing God. It is not meant to be an argument. It is not meant to be thrown out the window. It is meant to be reveal our broken and sinful nature and the desperate need of a Savior. And it's with this that you and I are going to move into chapter 2, where Paul begins to instruct Timothy on how to address the issues within the church by confronting worship gatherings and confronting men and women. Read with me. First of all, then, I urge that supplication, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in sight of God the Savior, who desires all people to be saved. And to come to the knowledge of truth, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher, an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying, Paul says, a teacher of Gentiles in faith and in truth. Paul's first charge to Timothy to begin to address the issues in the church is to hold gatherings that are rooted in prayer hold gatherings that are rooted in prayer. He calls him to do three things, to pray, to intercede, and give thanks. That their prayer should be oriented around that. When we gather together in worship, prayer should be a focal point of our gathering. Now, many of you prayed this morning when Josh or someone else from the stage led you in prayer, but I have a hard question for you this morning. Was that the first time you prayed when you walked in the room? Because if it was, you are missing part of the story. I don't say that to shame you. In fact, I say it to call you to action. If the first time you prayed this morning was when someone from the pulpit directed you, you're missing part of the story. No, when we walk in this room, all of us should be praying. Corporate prayer is, of course, powerful, but you don't need me, Josh, Mike, or anyone else who stands on this stage to pray for you. No, when you walk in this room, you walk in this room, you should be going to God in prayer yourself. Before you receive teaching and before you give worship, you should pray and ask God to do a couple of things. You can pray first to ask him to ready your heart. Ask him to ready your heart that it might be transformed. Ask him to ready your mind, to take thoughts captive, and so that you might be willing to receive and your mind might be willing to be transformed. Pray to set aside distractions. I don't know about you. I love that the YouVersion Bible app is on my phone, and I love that I can see the notes. Uh, But every once in a while, I get that notification that pops up from like Twitter or Instagram or whatever, and the next thing I know, I'm scrolling Instagram in the middle of church, and Mike's talking, and I'm like, what do you say? Right? Anyone else? Just me? That's okay. I'll repent right now. But hear that, right? We can pray ahead of time to set aside distractions. We can pray for others in this room. I love the prayer boards that are stationed all around this room. There's four down here, right? Four down here, and I think two up there. And when you come into this room, you could take an opportunity to not just pray for yourself, but to pray for others and to pray over what's written on those boards. Because prayer is meant to align our hearts with God's and remind ourselves that the story isn't all about us. Are you part of the story? Yes. Is there good things for you in this story? Yes. Is it all about you? No. 
prayer orients our hearts and orients our minds on the things of God, not on the things of us. It orients our hearts and it orients our minds on the things of God, not on the things of us. Church gatherings can become so routine. They can become a box on our list of things we do that I show up and I get and I leave. But God did not call you to show up, get, and leave. He called you to experience something that is meant to change your Monday through Saturday, not just your Sunday morning. And that starts with not just the people who are on this stage praying, which we do, but every single person in this room praying, that if the disciples of Jesus come together, you let prayer lead your heart as you enter into this space. But while these gatherings are rooted in prayer, Paul also shows Timothy and reminds Timothy these gatherings are rooted in the gospel message. These gatherings should be rooted in the gospel message, for we as Christians gather together for one reason, in celebration of the good news of Christ Jesus. Paul puts it this way, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is testimony given at the proper time. That at the right time, Christ Jesus came into the world for you and I to free us from our sin, of whom I am the worst and most unrighteous sinner. That's why I needed him. That's why you needed him. That is why we gather. We gather in celebration of that, to be encouraged by that, and to pray and to spur one another on. Paul gives this charge to Timothy to help begin to transform this church that is in terrible trouble by going back to the basics, prayer and the gospel. That's it. Go back to basics. But as we gather together, and while, of course, the gospel message and prayer should be the main thing, Paul then begins to address how men and women should act within these worship gatherings. And he first starts with the men. Where he says this in verse 8, I desire that in every place the man should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. 1 Timothy 2.8. Men, hear this this morning. How you lead matters. How you lead matters. I want you to remember that Paul is addressing the issue of false teaching, and what scholars believe to be happening here is that Paul addresses this issue that men in the church have begun to infight over speculations that are talked about in chapter 1. Rather than devoting themselves to prayer and to lifting of holy hands and to gathering together, they have turned to infighting. They've turned to making each other the enemy. And so Paul calls them back to the basics of what it means to be a godly man, to pray, to lift holy hands, to not lead with anger, And as I process through this message, I couldn't help but think about how many men in our church do lead faithfully. There are so many of you in this room who lead your families and lead your lives faithfully. I'm amazed on Sunday morning when I see a group of men gather at this cross and pray over the worship gatherings that are happening here. They lead the way. They take to heart what Scripture calls them to do, to be spiritual leaders. And to pray, they don't do it for recognition. They do it because it's what they feel like they need to do, what they're supposed to do. But as I also processed through this message, I I became aware of the conversations I've had even recently about men who don't lead. And if you're a man in this room and you're leading right now and you're faithful and you're a spiritual leader in your home and you're about to be these three things I'm going to describe, awesome. Awesome great, keep going. Hear this encouragement this morning. Stay faithful even in a culture that tells you to sit on the sidelines. Stay faithful. But I do believe there are men in this room who need to take this passage to heart this morning. That it's time for them to get off the sidelines. That it's time for you to stop being passive. That it's time for you to lead. It's time for you to lead. Here's the reality, men. According to Scripture, we are supposed to be three things in our home. First is you're supposed to be the priest, i.e. the spiritual leader of your home. Men, what that means is you lead the way in prayer and in scripture reading. Hard question for the married men in the room. 
When's the last time you prayed out loud for your wife? When's the last time you did that? When's the last time you prayed out loud for your kids? When was the last time you showed them the way? I know it's awkward. It's awkward to pray out loud when you don't do it on a regular basis. It's awkward to figure out, like, how do I, how do, I do this and then not feel like my kid just doesn't want to ignore me, or how can I do this and, you know, not feel weird about it. I get it. But it's going to be weird the first few times you do it. It's just part of it. It's anytime you do something new that is counterintuitive to how you have previously lived, it feels weird. It feels awkward. It's not normal. It's not normal for men to be spiritual leaders. But it's what God has called you to. Hear that this morning. It's not normal for you to be a spiritual leader, but it's what God has called you to. So lead the way by praying for your family. Lead the way by leading your family spiritually. Secondly, men are supposed to be the providers of their home. And I know there are a lot of men in our church who do this incredibly well. That they provide for their family's needs. There's a roof over their head, the bills are paid, everything is awesome. But men, being a provider goes much more than meeting the needs of your family physically. So much more than just a rent check or a mortgage check or paying the light bill. Being a provider for your family goes beyond that. If you pay the bills, yet you're a couch potato at home, there's a problem. Men, you must be fully engaged within the life of your family, not only just meeting their needs physically, financially, but spiritually and emotionally. Men, we are providers. We have a role to play within that. We have a way to lead within that for the care of our homes. And last but not least, men are protectors. Men protect the ones they love. That means men set boundaries for their family. They protect and they guard their family. It's important and it's imperative that we do that. The church needs strong men who will be priests, providers, and protectors. But the reality is so many men don't lead, and culture tells us that we are supposed to sit on the sidelines and be quiet and submissive. Yet that is not what God the Father has called you and I to. You were not called to be quiet and submissive. You were not called to sit on the sidelines, men. You were called to be leaders. You were called to therefore go to pray for your wife out loud, to pray for your kids out loud, to pray in this room, to lift your hands in worship. You were called to lead spiritually. Men, hear this this morning. The church and the world need godly men who are willing to step up and lead, who will not play passive, but play a little aggressive and go after the things of God, to do the things that are counterintuitive to the way of the world. And so, man, I want to challenge you this morning. We're going to have another song after communion and after a baptism, and maybe your next step this morning is to lift your hands in worship for the very first time as an act of surrender. I'm going to give you that challenge this morning, man, that if you've never lifted your hands in worship, give it a try this morning. I know it's weird, I know it's counterintuitive. I know it may feel awkward. And you may wonder, if people think you smell, could you open up your armpit and you're like, whew, did I put enough Old Spice on today? I get it, right? But I need you to hear this this morning. You were called to lead. Don't leave this service by sitting on the sidelines. Leave this service by engaging. As an act of surrender to God in prayer, ask him to equip you to lead, and he will. Now, Paul doesn't just instruct Timothy on the men, however. He goes on to talk about the women of the church as well. So let's keep reading in chapter, or chapter 2, verse 9, where it says, Likewise, also the women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman... Awkward. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. She, rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the man was deceived and became the transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness, with self-control. Women, hear this this morning. How you lead matters. Not just the men, but women, how you lead matters. 
Now, I want to be clear about what is happening in this passage. There are women in this passage who, according to the Bible Project summary, are treating church like a fashion show, who are showing up dressed in their wealth and dressed immodestly and are showing it off. Scholars even believe that women are usurping leadership positions and teaching this false doctrine that Paul is speaking against. It's important to understand that context as we read this. And Paul here is asking them and instructing Timothy to teach them to shift their thinking to not be concerned about with how they look, but rather what they do. Hear that? With not about how they look, but rather with what they do. That's why in verse 10 it says, but with what is proper for women who present, profess godliness, with good works. Paul here is saying, don't worry about your attire, but worry about the good works of the Lord that you are called to. And then we get into verse 11 through 15, where Paul says he doesn't permit a woman to teach, and he goes back to the story of Adam and Eve, and he talks about being saved through childbearing. And this is one of those parts in Scripture where, as Peter would put it in 2 Peter, Paul can be confusing at times. But we want to read this part, 11 through 15, in light of what we just talked about in chapter 1, right? Because Paul here is being very intentional, beckoning back to the law, right? Which we just talked about, the law... The Torah is meant to free us and transform us to live the way Christ Jesus has called us to live. What Paul is not saying is, women, you can't be spiritual leaders. No, in fact, in 2 Timothy, Paul talks about the faith of Timothy's mom and grandmother that was instilled in him. No, women, you have a part to play in being spiritual leaders. You do. It just looks different than the men. This is also not saying that those who can't have children can't be saved, because that's a little confusing if we read it like that just verbatim. No, Paul is beckoning back to the law. Hear that. He's beckoning back to the law, what was supposed to be the gift of creation. And this world is broken, and it's messed up, and it's muddy. And I know there are people in this room who maybe have wanted a child for years and can't have children, and that breaks my heart for you. And I know there are people in this room who aren't married and want to be married and want a spiritual leader in, my, in their home, and that breaks my heart for you. But I want you to hear, you are not missing part of the story because you don't have children and you are not married. No, you are still called to play a part in the story. You are called to still play a part within the story. You are called to be a spiritual leader especially to the next generation. You have an important role to pay, to play, to pass on wisdom. Play that part. Play that part well. Let your good works shine. Let them be seen. Women, you have a part to play. Be reminded that Paul is not saying you can't be a spiritual leader. He's going back to the law. This part must be read in the full context of Scripture. In the full context of Scripture, in the letter to the Ephesians, Paul says, men, lead your wives like Christ leads the church. Be willing to die for your wife. Be willing to set your life aside for your wife. And wives, submit to your husband in respect and loyalty. What Paul is getting at here is a mutual submission not meant to divide a wedge, not meant to say one is better than the other, but meant to complement each other. That's what Paul is getting at here, a mutual submission. So women in this room, hear this, how you lead matters. Being a godly woman matters. Praying for your family matters. Instilling your faith in the next generation matters. Doing good works matters. You have a part to play as well. You were not meant to consume you were meant to participate. All were meant to participate, both men and women, because the bottom line for today is how you worship matters. How you worship matters. And worship is so much more than just coming in on a Sunday morning and singing a song and listening to a message. No, it's about how you show up. It's about how you act in this room. It's about how you act on Monday morning. Worship is so much more encompassing than just something you participate in on Sunday. It's meant to be a way in which you live your life. So how you live your life matters. How you show up in this room matters. How you act in this room matters. How your heart is feeling in this room matters. 
So the challenge is simple this week. Lead in your worship. Lead in your worship. Be willing to show up and lead. Men, pray. Lift your hands and worship. Go before God and ask Him to lead the way, not just in your room, but in your families as well. Women, pray as well. Seek godliness and good works, and everyone remember the reason that we gather together. 2 Timothy, verse 5 and 6. For there is one God, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Christ Jesus shows up in our broken and sinful nature, fulfills the law, doesn't abolish it, fulfills it, shows us that only one could be righteous, and frees us from our sin, from our death, and he gives us a brand new life. And it would have been just enough for Jesus to die on the cross, raised from the dead three days later, snap his fingers, and it's all sing kumbaya in heaven. That would have been amazing, glorious, and wonderful. But that's not the end of the story. A couple chapters later, 40 days later, he commissions you and he sends you out to go and make disciples. You have a part to play. How you lead matters. And that's why we gather. We gather to play our part. It would have been more than enough for Jesus just to save us and wipe the same slate clean, which of course he does. But he goes so much further than that. He saves in commissions. Therefore, we must repent and go forth. We must repent and go forth. So here's just a moment. We're going to take communion. But first, if you're somebody in this room who does not believe in Jesus, I'll be right up front after service. I would love to talk to you. And your next step this morning and leading in your worship is to be reminded that you're here for a reason. You're here for a reason this morning. I believe that. I believe if you don't know God, if you've never been baptized, if you've not put your faith and trust in him, you are here for a reason this morning. And that reason might be just to pray and ask God to reveal himself to you and have a conversation with somebody about what it means to follow him. And I would love to be that person for you this morning. But for those of us who gather together and call ourselves followers of Jesus, this next moment is an act of repentance and commissioning. Communion is an act of repentance, turning ourselves back to God, being reminded that we are the worst of the sinners in need of Christ Jesus, in need of a mediator, because we have fumbled the ball. We have gotten it wrong. But then it's also a commissioning to therefore go. That because of Jesus' grace, because of his resurrection, I am then commissioned to go. Communion calls you and I to repentance and then commissions us. Jesus doesn't just save us. He gives us a mission. So therefore, how you lead in your life matters. Because you have a mission. And the question is, will you participate or will you consume? Let us pray. Dear Jesus, Lord, we come to you right now, repentant. Repentant for the things that we've gotten wrong. Repentant for the mistakes that we've made. And Lord Jesus, we ask that you forgive us. Lord, thank you that you are the mediator between us and the Father. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Lord, it would have been more than enough for you to save us been more than enough for you to save us, but you don't just save us, you commission us to go. Lord Jesus, we love you, we thank you. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. So each week, we take the bread, which reminds us of his body that was nailed to the cross for our sins, a death he did not deserve, a death you and I deserve. But this death will grant us so much more than we could possibly imagine. Eat in remembrance of that. And we come to the juice each week, which reminds us of his blood that was shed for a multitude of sins that forgives you and commissions you to go and leave it, live a new life, to lead a new life, to drink in remembrance of that. Lord Jesus, we love you.
Lord Jesus, we want to say thank you for all you've done. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.